Did you know there is this thing that people do where they hang out with people in order to form romantic or intimate relationships? It's called dating. And it's something that I, as an honest truth teller, can say I have done before. Many times, in fact. One of the most popular ways to do this these days is online. Around 3 in 10 adults say they've done it like this, most commonly young people. And around a third of those looking for something serious say they actually have succeeded there. Tinder obviously is the most popular app, especially for people under 30, with Bumble and Badoo being close behind. Match Group which owns Tinder, Hinge and many others, and Magic Labs which owns Bumble and Badoo, are by far the biggest companies in the space, controlling 56% and 33% of downloads respectively. However, with dating there are two obvious problems. The first is that it requires two or more people. <coughs> yeah. And the second is that people, especially online, are terrible. Among people who have used online dating, only a small majority, 53%, say their experience has been positive. When looking at gender, men seem to have it slightly better. 57% of them rate it positively, whereas only 48% of women do. Both have difficulty finding partners, reaching out, first starting or avoiding sexual activity, and ending dates. More than half of women say they have felt overwhelmed by the amount of messages they get. I know I can relate to that. Whereas 64% of men say they felt insecure because of the lack of them. This is mainly caused by the fact that dating apps have a significant gender imbalance with basically all of them having more men than women. With Bumble having the most even ratio with 43% women and 57% being men and Tinder having it by far the worst with only 22% of users being women. Men and women also tend to look for different things on dating apps. Men generally want something more casual and short term, while women want something more long term and a validation of their attractiveness. All of this basically encourages men to be more aggressive and women to be more selective in their pursuits. And what could possibly go wrong in a system that encourages men to be more aggressive when approaching women? Anyway, most women have been sent sexually explicit messages they didn't ask for. More than 40% have people continued to message them after being told they were not interested. And a tenth have been threatened with physical violence. A third of women report regularly having to deal with offensive behavior towards them. And only 12% say they always felt respected. Whereas 65% of male users said so. This pushes women to be more selective or off the Fs entirely. With 55% of women who deleted them saying they left them out of frustration and an overall negative experience. While 67% of the men said they deleted them because they found a new partner. So the gender imbalance becomes a self-enforcing process. That doesn't mean that online dating is all rainbows and sunshine for men. The lack of engagement engagement they receive can really suck and frustration and demotivation are also one of the most cited reasons why men leave the apps. But dating apps specifically prey on this insecurity. They usually offer services that help your visibility in the algorithm and people, mostly men, struggling to get matches are way more likely to pay for those. Companies obviously understand that and will use the women as a commodity to squeeze as much money out of desperate men as possible, even charging men more sometimes. Around a third of users reported having paid for services like this, with nearly half the men saying they did and less than 30% of women. If you don't pay, they will limit how much you can use the apps and your visibility in the algorithm, so this is how they make most of their money. Ads only make up a tiny fraction of their total revenue, with Bumble for example it only being like a 3% slice of their total pie. And it's obviously effective since paying users say they have a better time than their non-paying counterparts. So we can say both genders have it basically equally bad, right? That doesn't mean that online dating is all doom and gloom, however. Relationships started online tend to be stronger than those which began face to face and are more likely to still be together two years later. Also intimacy develops faster online and how they interact online is the main way how people determine whether or not they like each other, whereas face to face superficial things like appearance tend to be more important. So surprisingly online dating is actually less shallow than real life dating. Somehow. This is most likely because you already get to know each other before the date starts. Well, in face to face meetings the getting to know each other part only really starts at the first date. So how can we have the good without the bad? What's being done to prevent abuse from either the companies or other users? <laughs> Not much. Dating apps are lagging behind other online services like Uber in their security measures. Over a third of women participating in a 2019 ProPublica report on online dating said they were sexually assaulted and over half of those women said they've been raped. They also found that assault made possible by dating apps were more violent than those who were facilitated through other means. So what do the apps do? Basically, just this. And then they'll put in the fine print that they're not responsible for the actions of their users. 
They also offer photo verification so you can make sure they actually look like what their picture says and have TOS banning hate speech and harassment. Bumble probably has the best security encouraging users to report if the other person makes them feel unsafe or uncomfortable or if you know the other person is dangerous offline. They also work with Bloom, a website which offers free courses for survivors of sexual assault. Match, which owns most of the big names, sometimes also bans accounts across their platform, so if you're banned on Hinge, you also can't use Tinder. They also partnered with non-profits, so you can perform a background check to see if someone has a criminal record. Though, of course, each search costs money. These companies also store a huge amount of data from their users, so a breach poses significant risks ranging from blackmail, doxing and financial losses to identity thefts, emotional distress, reputational damage, revenge porn, stalking and so much more. But who cares about breaches when they have been found to just sell users data to third parties, including HIV status? And there are barely any laws protecting people, with companies never really being held accountable for the actions of their users. In the US, only half of states have laws that even require there being any security measure whatsoever, with California being the only one that gives people the right to access and delete their personal information held by companies. And also the police can access your data without a warrant. Decades of Supreme Court rulings affirm that individuals don't have a reasonable expectation of privacy in data they share with others, like companies. Even though they have acknowledged that technology makes surveillance and data collection way easier and there may need to be a change in law. Uber, for example, also faced a lot of these criticisms in the past, but after pressure they implemented more safety features like a reporting system, 24-7 specialist support and checkup features which allow people to share their rights with trusted contacts. And after this, sexual assault numbers dropped significantly. However, as many safety features as there possibly could be, they don't really mean much when users are not aware of them. And dating apps don't really do a good job of informing users. Research suggests some effective measures dating apps could deploy include requiring people to read about consent and dating safety, improving systems which block unwanted sexual messages, transparent systems to report assault, and responding quickly to reports. The good news is that dating apps are already pretty rapidly improving their features, but time will tell if it's enough. Also, most people support requiring users to go through some sort of background check before being able to create an account. However, sexual assault is severely underreported, so this will miss a lot of people. There are also things you can do as a user, of course. Limit the amount of info you share. Don't send photos that could be linked to your social media accounts and avoid telling them where you live, work or regularly visit. Try doing some research into your date. Don't leave drinks or personal items alone. And when meeting for the first time, make sure it's somewhere public. Also tell people where you're at. If you feel unsafe, try getting some help from someone nearby like a bartender or a waiter and make sure you're not dependent on the other person for transportation. That way you have more control. Making online dating safer could also help alleviate the gender imbalance on the apps. Where it instead of being a system of self-enforced negativity, it becomes more positive, with men being less desperate and thus less aggressive. But with the gender imbalance being the way it is, it begs the question, is safety the only reason it exists? Well, women also tend to be less active in the early stages of relationships, and the gambling-like nature of dating sites might just be more attractive to men who tend to gamble more. So then, where the hoes at? Where do women get their arm candies from? It seems like that with men being the primary pursuers that women just have less need to go out there, considering they are way more likely to be approached in real life places like work, school, parties or bars. But I think the place where this proportionality really goes in women's favor is their social networks. So meeting people through friends and family. In other words, I'm fucked. Women's social groups tend to be much larger and more diverse than men's, so they are just way more likely to meet someone through those. It also helps that someone who's been vetted by someone they trust is more appealing than some rando online. It's funny how much private companies have taken over our lives to the point where they are even dominating our love lives. Does that mean that we have to look for ways to cut them out? Probably, but for now they're here to stay, so just support reform for laws to finally catch up with the 21st century. And just do what works for you, just remember there are always other options, they don't own you. But you could own a subscription to the channel by just pressing that subscribe button. Do it now and get a piece of the comment section absolutely free. Just leave a comment. Please. Okay, bye.